أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Can you hear me uh, properly? Yes, inshallah, it's fine. Okay. How about my screen? Are you able to see my screen? Yes, that's fine also. Okay, sure. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam I begin by thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and glorifying him for the opportunity to be part of this very blessed gathering and I ask, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those about whom he has said in the words of Prophet sallallahu wasallam that those who are gathered in order to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in order to glorify him about those people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would send angels upon them and tranquility will descend upon them and Allah will remember them in his company. So we ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those uh, who will be remembered in that very grand company. My brothers and sisters, uh, as it was just briefly mentioned here, I'm very excited about this uh, initiative that we have started about the online Quran study circle. <clears throat> and as Brother Ashfaq was mentioning, that this is going to be a series of uh, study circles and gatherings where, inshallah, we will be covering a variety of topics and some of which you may have already seen. <clears throat> so this week, uh, we are focused on these ayat of Surah Al-Hajj, uh, the last two ayat of Surah Al-Hajj, which uh, are part of this syllabus which was described and which was subscribed, or actually Brother Khurram Murad, which many of you may have read his book, Way to the Quran. Uh, in this book, he has prescribed this syllabus, which for an Islamic worker it really provides the essential ingredients and the ammunition in terms of what is going to power their lives and how would they look at this world and its realities and how would they understand the mission of their lives. So inshallah, uh, this week we'll be focused on these last two ayat and inshallah we'll try to get the understanding and the wisdom behind these verses. So, as it was described, this, uh, those of you who uh, don't know me, my name is Javed Siddiqui. And today we will be focused on this topic of being curious about your mission and respons responsibility in this life. I'll share with you <clears throat> a little introduction to the surah so that you are at least understanding of the context in which the surah was revealed. When you look at the uh, the subjects that are being taken up in this surah, you realize that there are subjects that are Makki subjects and there are some of them are from the Madani era. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing three groups of people in this, in this surah. He's addressing the pagans of Makkah, the Quraysh, the Kuffar. He's also addressing those Muslims who are unsure about this message, who are really looking at it from an angle where if it is everything is good in their life, if they are enjoying the bounties of Allah, then that is good. But when tests are presented to them, they are unsure, they are backing off. In this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also addresses the hypocrites and finally addresses the believers. Now, 
in context, the surah warns the pagans of Mecca about their behavior, about the denial and the ignorance that they have exhibited. It's rebuking the their allegiance of false gods and their ill-awaited fate. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning them, straighten up your path, straighten up your actions, otherwise you will receive the same ill fate of previous nations. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <clears throat> is admonishing the pagans of Mecca because these people have stopped the Muslims. Because again, if you look at the uh, context and the time frame of these uh, ayat, they really come at the time where it was the end of the Meccan period and the beginning of the Madani period. And in that same context, it, when it talks about the, uh, the actions of Quraysh during that time, it's really warning them that you have taken up a way which is going to only bring ruins to you. You are stopping the Meccans, stopping people who have the right to visit the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And instead of allowing them to come and visit and perform their religious obligations, you're stopping them. This has left really the people of Mecca in a very awkward situation because they could not really deny this. And this sent a very interesting message to the rest of Arabia who was looking at this conflict in a, in a very keen way as to what is going to happen today the Meccans who have animosity against these, their brothers who have migrated from the city. So if they can stop them, then maybe tomorrow they will also be stopping them. So it has really left the Meccans in a very awkward position. And finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing the believers, the Muslims, and who are being reminded about the special favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the special status that was given to them as we will read the ayat inshallah ta'ala later on and he reminds them about their very special status of being witnesses onto mankind so when you look at this whole surah in in that context let's inshallah recite these ayat so we can understand uh, the wisdom and inshallah the spirit and the message that it delivers يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا ارْكَعُوا وَاسْجُدُوا وَاعْبُدُوا رَبَّكُمْ وَفَعَلُوا الْخَيْرَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِهِ هُوَ اشْتَبَاكُمْ وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجٍ مِلَّةَ بِيكُمْ إِبْرَاهِيمٍ هو سماكم المسلمين من قبل وفي هذا ليكون الرسول شهيدا عليكم ليكون الرسول شهيدا عليكم وتكونوا شهداء على الناس فأقيموا الصلاة وآتوا الزكاة وتصموا بالله هو مولاكم I'll read the translation to you. Allah subhanahu wa says, Believers, bow down and prostrate yourselves before your Lord and serve your Lord and do good that you may prosper. Strive in the cause of Allah in a manner worthy of that striving. He has chosen you for his, for his, for his task. And he has not laid upon you any hardship in religion. Keep to the faith of your father Abraham. Allah named you Muslims earlier. And even in this book, that the messenger may be a witness over you and that you may be witnesses over all mankind. So establish prayer and pay zakah and hold fast to Allah. He is your protector. What an excellent protector. What an excellent helper. So as we start to <clears throat> kind of look at these ayat and the different messages and the words and the commands that are being given to the believer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off by saying, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu ka'u wa sudu. 
And in this, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing the believers and saying, oh, who you believe? Prostrate and have and make sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, when you look at the uh, <clears throat> different tafasir and uh, some of them and some of the narrators of tafasir would take this message, the irka'u wasjidu, as to have complete surrender to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when Allah is talking about, and in the next word, wa'abudu rabbakum wa fa'alu khair and worship your Lord and do good. So it's a very interesting uh, uh, combination of words. So he's talking about the ruku and sujood, and that is the establishment of prayer and the complete surrender. At the same time, he's talking about wa'abudu rabbakum wa fa'alu khair So the question becomes, Come sometimes is why would Rabbakum that you worship, you should worship your Lord and your master. And then he follows that with the words Wafa'ul Khayr and then do good. So the question becomes is uh, why would you uh, separate or what would be the meaning of doing good that is outside of doing ibadah? Wouldn't every good would be part of ibadah? And if you look at the tafsir of uh, uh, Dr. Aswar Ahmad. He brings this point. He says, really, when he is talking, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the fi'l al-khayr, which is the, uh, the action of good, then he is referring to, uh, to be in the service of mankind. And my brothers and sisters, when we talk about service, uh, many a times when we talk about humanitarian work and servicing to mankind, we are under the impression that we are basically all that we have to do is to provide food and provide sustenance to provide uh, physical comforts and uh, means of life to people yes that is part of it but at the same time one of the biggest favors one of the biggest provisions and one of the biggest services to any human being is to be concerned about the akhira of this human being is to safeguard their final abort, is to save them from the fire of hell. So when in this context you look at this ayah, the message is very clear that all you all who you believe, surrender completely and submit completely to the will of Allah by worshiping him and doing good deeds and doing service to mankind by safeguarding obviously you would provide services to their to their physical well-being at the same time their well-being in the hereafter is even paramount and then he ends the ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says la'allakum tuflihun and we understand the word la'alla which uh, comes from the root word that you may uh, that you may attain uh, so there is this element of uh, uh, you would do this so that you would. لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ And the next word, which is تُفْلِحُونَ, uh, many, many translations would translate that word to uh, uh, success or uh, prosperity, um, which are correct, except there is also another element of this. فَلَّاح in the Arabic language is, is uh, referred to as, as the farmer. And now we all understand the aspect of farming. A farmer would work in his fields for an entire season. Um, he continues to plow the field, seed the ground, and do whatever he can in terms of uh, providing water and watering the, watering the land and cultivating it, and continuing to work without any knowledge of what is going to happen at the end of the season so but he continues to do that in the hopes that he is going to one day and at the end of the season he will reap the the, the rewards of that work so similarly a believer uh, in his lifetime so we all continue to do good we all continue to uh, follow the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the understanding with the clear understanding that at the end of this which we will never see in this lifetime, but we are continuing to work on this based on the opinion, based on the understanding and belief and the conviction that at the end of this life and in the, in the, in the next life, we will be rewarded accordingly. 
And uh, uh, now we have to understand that the concept of falah and the concept of success and the concept of uh, prosperity uh, has to be well understood. You cannot assume that I being a Muslim, I being born in a Muslim family, uh, having a Muslim name would have the guarantee that I don't have to really work hard for this thing. No, absolutely. Uh, we have been given the stories and if you have read Quran and you understand uh, a majority of the Quran is made up of stories. Stories that are really telling the believers of don't be like those or this is the fate of those who uh, who would s stay away from the right path or who do not follow the exact commandments of Allah. And the children of Israel, uh, Bani Israel, they, about them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Tilka amaniyuhum. They had this notion, this false notion that we being the chosen people, that we will, will be uh, given uh, paradise, that we, we, we have the special status, even though we may not work, we may not follow, just because we were the chosen people that will continue to be uh, blessed by Allah in this life and the hereafter. And we've seen from their stories that not, not how everything went for them. So <clears throat> we, uh, we hear this story. So this is very important for all of us to understand that this message that has been given to the people uh, who have believed that not only that you have to establish and submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to worship him, to do the deeds of the good deeds by spreading the knowledge about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that, and that will, with the mercy and grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will enable you to become one that would be uh, ready or that would be blessed with, uh, uh, with prosperity and success. Um, another interesting element, sometimes if you look at it linguistically, so that you may prosper. And uh, <clears throat> when you look at that, uh, you could say, well, this there is an element of maybe, because in some of the translation, it, it is translated, the word la'alla is translated uh, that so you may. So there is, is, so the question becomes, is this a scenario where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, maybe you will be successful? And, uh, uh, and many of the Farsir, they say, <clears throat> It's really not like that. It is, it is what a king would tell people. When a king would tell his people, okay, do this. You'll be, you may be successful. You, you may attain this or you may attain that. So when you start to look at it in that context, you start to realize that if a king who is telling his people that if you do this, you may be chosen to perform a bigger task or chosen to be given a bigger reward. Now, it would not be uh, uh, up to the status of a king that he would promise his people something and then he would turn around uh, on them. So how could that be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the king of the kings? So when he is saying that you may be successful, then definitely those who would follow that path would definitely be given success, inshallah. So continuing forward, in the next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَاهِدُ فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِهِ هُوَشْتَبَاكُمْ وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجْ مِلَّةَ أَبِيكُمْ إِبْرَاهِيمُ هُوَ سَمَّاكُمْ وَالْمُسْلِمِينَ مِنْ قَبْلُ وَفِي هَذَا And in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clarifying and calling on to people as to what is it going to take. And the word that is used here, وَجَاهِدُ فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِ جَاهِدُ and jihad, those terms that are been described in detail uh, in the Book of Allah and through the Sunnah of Prophet The one of the key, as a matter of fact, when you talk about jihad uh, and the struggle that you go through to Give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the true, what, it, what he is, his, his capable, what he's deserving of. What's basically saying is, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you all these bounties in your life. And he has bestowed upon you this very special status that we will talk about in a second here. So when it comes to that, it's basically saying, You need to take action. You need to go out of your way. You need to do whatever is possible in your capacity and uh, in your ability to get to that level. Because uh, <clears throat> when you talk about uh, jihad, many of the scholars would would would, would uh, describe jihad as jihad al nafs, for example. So when you are uh, obviously jihad has other meaning, which is the the word that is used in Quran, the word of qital, uh, which is uh, uh, the, the fight in the in the path of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala on the battlefield. But in this context, when every time Quran refers to the jihad, he's referring to that effort, to that uh, actions by human beings to attain a certain goal. Whatever is it going to take to bring the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fight all sorts of, uh, uh, you know, opposition in his path. Uh, <clears throat> and one time the Prophet uh, would address uh, a group of people who were coming back uh, from an actual battle. And he, he, he said to them, he said, you are coming, you're returning from a small jihad to the bigger jihad, which is the jihad of nafs. So you have left the battlefield and you would may think that the jihad or the qital in the path of, in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the largest of its kind, but that's not the case. As a matter of fact, what a human being has to go and fight the desires and fight the opposition inside his heart, uh, the fight that he has to engage in with shaitan, when he is as uh, trying to uh, move him away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then and he says, Who is the vacuum? He has chosen you. Uh, <clears throat> the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave this status to the people of uh, the children of Israel, and they were referred to as the chosen people. And at some point in time in their and and especially uh, when the ayat uh, were revealed uh, about the change of qibla, and uh, I'm sure we can we can hear about that. But in those ayat, one of the key things that happened at that time it was the turning of the leadership of this world. That the turn the the title of the leadership of this world and the responsibility of leading this world was given to the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he has chosen you. He has given this huge responsibility of leading mankind uh, and saving them from the fire of hell to the followers of this uh, of this prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So this is a huge responsibility, and this is a huge status. And we, as the followers of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and part of his ummah. We need to get to work. We need to start putting in all of our efforts in order to achieve that higher goal, inshallah ta'ala. And he continues to say, Umayya ja'ala alaykum fi dini min haraj. And uh, he has not, I mean, when you look at now that this deen that has been given to us, just imagine, just imagine the example of the prayers. If the original form in which prayers were prescribed to mankind were to be there, were to be uh, implemented or were to be given to this ummah uh, the 50 times a day, just imagine what would have been the case or what would have it taken to be able to do that. And that in itself is a, is a huge uh, burden. Uh, it's a physical burden. It's an emotional burden. And it could have taken away from the livelihood of human beings. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us, He has not laid upon you any hardship in this religion. So in previous nations, there were some times, there were certain things they were not allowed to do. Um, to the point where they could not, there were hardships uh, they could not tolerate. So it was hard sometimes. But in case of the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whatever has been given to them, it has been doable, very doable. Absolutely. For sure, there will be a, there will be times where you're 
required to do certain things, that you are required to do to perform certain duties, um, and that may take effort, but so is the case with everything else in life. You don't become a doctor or an engineer or a lawyer or a scientist without any hard work. So that's just part of life. So basically, you are so blessed that he's been, uh, that he has bestowed upon you this title and he's given you this responsibility, so get to work. And they're reminded about Millata Abikum Ibrahim. And uh, it's very interesting that how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would refer to Ibrahim alayhi salam as your father. That this is the way of your father. Um, this is who was al Muslimin, that he's the one who has called you Muslimin. So, which also brings about the, uh, the point about We and the previous nations from the time of Nuh alayhi salam till the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, these all of these nations, they were they were Muslims to begin with. They were submitters to the will of Allah to begin with. They were the ones who uh, were given the responsibility of obeying Allah in this land and of being a Khalifa and being a someone that who would implement his wishes in this land. So the whole concept about Muslims, and when you look at the, uh, the ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah, Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail alayhi salam, as they were erecting the Kaaba, as they were uh, building the walls of Kaaba, what, what, what was their dua? Rabbana waj'alla muslimayni laka wa min dhurriyatina ummatan muslima. So, oh Allah, make us, of, make us, of, make us both, make both of us, as Muslims, and from among our progeny and our, our nation, the nation that are coming down from our offsprings, create the Ruyatina Ummatan Muslima. Omid the Ruyatina Ummatan Muslima, Muslimatan Laka wa Arina Manasikram. So you start to see uh, this whole the umbrella of Islam and the umbrella of Muslims. And this is not being anything new that was given to the Prophet. This is the same path on which all previous prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have uh, <clears throat> uh, so all all these prophets have literally were on this path and coming to the last ayat which are some of the uh, very great ayat that we need to all be uh, aware of liyakuna rasulu shahidan alaykum wa takunu shuhada ala nas and Understanding that this status and this uh, uh, position that was given to the Muslims, it is being given to the Muslims so that on the day of judgment, because again, have to remember, uh, after the Prophet wasallam, there will be no more prophets. So now this Ummah of Muhammad wasallam is being really given this next, they are part of this uh, golden uh, ring, or golden connection. Uh, <clears throat> so... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us that you need to uh, be aware of this responsibility and what you need to do فَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُ الزَّكَاةَ وَعَتَصِمُ بِاللَّهِ هُوَ مَوْلَاكُمْ فَنِعْمَ الْمَوْلَى وَنِعْمَ النَّصِيرِ And in order to be able to accomplish this great mission and in order to be able to really take this mission to its fullest potential we as Muslims need to establish our prayers, establish uh, charity in this land, and really fast to the hold of Allah, to the rope of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, to associate ourselves with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala because He is the true protector. And the word Mawla has such a beautiful meanings, and we don't have time to to go through that. But uh, understanding that. This status that is given to the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, and in this, in, this, in this context of these ayat, you have to understand what is Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala trying to tell us. He's sending us the message of Tawheed. He's reminding the believers about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the, and the concept of Risala and this golden chain in which we are linked to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because we, not just because we are part of his uh, progeny, we, because we are the carriers of that message. And finally, that on the day of judgment, we will be asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about what have we accomplished. So in conclusion, the Ummah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, is just not 
uh, a, a free bird, if I may want to call use that term. It's, it really has a heavy burden of conveying the message of Islam to the masses, to, to the human beings. On the Day of Judgment, we will be asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about what have we done. Uh, we will be, this is part of our collective responsibility. And we've seen in previous nations what has happened to those nations who have not been able to, uh, you know, really deliver on their responsibility. And on the Day of Judgment, in this world, we are responsible as collectively as nations. And we, our, our fate will be part of uh, the fate of nations. And we see that on, on a day-to-day -day basis. We as Muslim, as, as Muslim we, if, since we are not able to, um, in the last few centuries, we have not been able to, we've not had a very key focused, uh, uh, our eyes are not on the actual goal. And as a result of that, we have been uh, suffering humiliation. We have been suffering uh, all sorts of punishments, uh, if I may use the word uh, in, in, in that way. But all sorts of reminders by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this you are not keeping your eyes on the goal that's been given to you. On the day of judgment, we have to be mindful of our own responsibility in terms of what we will be answering to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have we as individuals, so in this world, we are responsible as collective nations, and our fate is connected to our nations. And on the day of judgment, we will be responsible to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on an individual best, individual level. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, allow us the ability to understand uh, the mission of our lives, of what is really being asked of us. Uh, we are here as a result of responsibility. So we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, guide us to protect us and to give us the understanding and the wisdom as to what this message to that we may deliver this message to the masses uh, in the best possible ways inshallah ta'ala so i will conclude with this and i think we will open up uh, this for connect for question answers brother javed mashallah that's a very beneficial presentation so in terms of question and answers um, the procedure will be to submit questions in writing uh, through the questions tab within the webinar. So, inshallah, if you have any questions, please um, submit them in writing, and inshallah, I'll bring them forward. So, I have one question uh, that, that's come up. As we reflect on the verse that you recited, uh, which said, and strive hard in the way of Allah, in a manner worthy of striving. Can you provide your own advice to the worker of Islam on how to self-critique oneself and, and ask the question, are, are we ourselves doing enough to make ourselves worthy uh, of that striving? How do we self-assess ourselves and how do we motivate ourselves uh, to strive in the way that is deserving of Allah. What would be your advice? Um, it's an excellent question. I think it's a question that I think every one of us uh, grapples with and uh, struggles with um, as we live our lives. So the way I look at it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed every one of us. Obviously, we can't really compare and contrast. Sometimes, we get into this uh, notion of trying to compare and contrast uh, uh, with people who are before us and uh, the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, the Prophets, and so on and so forth. But I think from a realistic perspective, uh, obviously those are great role models that we always have to and continue to inspire um, towards uh, what they have done. And that's how what we would say is that the upper limit of what a human being can reach. But the rest of humanity is, I think, uh, all of us and most of us are in that uh, middle to lower range sometimes. And we are constantly, need to, we need to ask ourselves, what are some of the key skills? What are the, some of the key things that I as a human being can do? Allah would have blessed every human being with special gifts, with special skills, 
uh, with special abilities. The question we have to ask ourselves is, okay, so I work for a, some sort of a for-profit company or I work for an organization and I do a lot of things for them and I go out of my way and stay long hours to make sure that they are making profits. They are actually making money. Now, when I come back home and when I work with the, uh, the masjid in my area, with I work with the Islamic school in my area, with I work with the a national organization in my area, or whichever capacity, basically I'm working with yeah, any Muslim organization, am I exerting myself in the same manner that I've been exerting at my work for a company or for uh, making a living? Maybe it's, it's about uh, uh, making a living for myself. I'm a businessman and I'm uh, spending hours and hours uh, at my businesses, at my work, to be able to uh, uh, increase my uh, my income it's a very simple question i think you as an individual know the answer i think if you ask your heart you will understand is when it comes to uh proficiency uh, when it comes to professionalism when it comes to uh, completeness when it comes to uh, the the quality of work that you do if you do that um, for you know organizations work or whatever other venues that you're doing for other purposes when when the purpose is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you have to ask yourself am I exerting my abilities and my skills in the same way I think you'll get the answer Jazakallah khair um, on the job. So um, I think this has been a very beneficial session. Um, we are out of time uh, for the session. I know there have been a few other questions, and we'll, we'll try and find a way of uh, answering those. Um, slides, inshallah, will be distributed. And going forward, uh, recordings will also be available um, for, for these sessions. Um, so just to conclude, um, these sessions will continue for 12 weeks. Uh, next week's session will be at the same time, 9 PM Eastern time. Uh, it will be delivered by uh, Sheikh Mohammed uh, Al Shinawi, who is a research fellow at Yakin Institute, uh, and we will be studying Surah Baqarah, uh, verses 40 to 47. Uh, and the title will be What Happens When We Are Ungrateful. Uh, so that will be next week, inshallah. Uh, and just to remind people, um, those of you who are interested in the organization ICNA, we invite you to join. Uh, and the, the website is www.icna.org slash home slash join us. Uh, so please do consider that. Uh, and uh, in the interest of time, we will conclude uh, today's session. Uh, I'd like to thank the speaker uh, and I'd like to thank the, the participants um, for uh, joining the session and um, benefiting from it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, give us a tawfiq to, to implement what we have heard. Um, uh, and subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdi. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu alayk. Assalamu alaykum.